Hello and welcome to the Writing and Publishing a Book Series panel. We have a great lineup for you here with some authors who have some really high number of books that they've published and most of those are in series. So we're going to cover how you can go about writing a series and some strategies to keep the series fresh and engaging for your readers. So I will let the panelists introduce themselves. Mal, why don't we start with you? Sure. My name's Mal Cooper and I write under the name MD Cooper. And all of my books take place in a universe I made called Aeon 14. And I think we have 26 series now in Aeon 14. All right. I think that makes you qualified to talk on this subject. I feel so inadequate now. <laughs> well, Rick, Rick you, you're pretty impressive unto yourself. So why don't you talk a little bit about your work? I'm Rick Partlow. I uh, write mostly military science fiction, some space opera. I have 41 books in, I believe it's 10 series now. It might be 11. I, I kind of lose track. A lot of them are in the same universe, the uh, what I call the birthright universe. And uh, so it's, it's all... Uh, related, but not the same characters. No. Awesome. Uh, well, I am Amy Duboff. I publish under AK Duboff. Most of my work is in the Catacle universe, though I've also written in Aeon 14 with Mal. We have the Serenity duet, mm -hmm. and I have a standalone trilogy called Dark Stars. And I think there are Two, uh, two series that I've written completely on my own in Catacle, and we have two published trilogies with co-authors, and more are in the works right now. So uh, I have a good deal of series work. I think uh, about 16 books published right now in Catacle. So uh, we also were going to have Jay Ann Cheney on here. Unfortunately, he is ill and unable to attend and we're hopefully expecting Retsy Bruno as well. Uh, but he is not on right now, but he may join us a little bit later on. But we're gonna dive into it and get going. So first questions to you, how do you begin planning out a series? Mal, you want to go first or you want me to? Okay, I'll go first. Um, for me, a series is all about uh, a character's journey. I always think of a character first and where I want to take them, what their goals are, and what I want them to go through. And I then um, create a setting. And luckily, I everything I write is in the same universe, so my setting is not too hard to come up with. I pick sort of the corner of the universe they're going to be in, the setting I want them to have. I just drop the character into the setting. And I, and I give the character the goals I want them to have. And I'm like, how are you going to get there? And that's kind of how I let it unfold. I'm kind of bass backwards to that. <laughs> I, I usually start a series with, a, uh, with an idea, uh, a background idea to, to set things in, like a, a war, a collapse of a, of a government, a expansion. And then I think of what would be the most interesting story to tell. And I work from there and bring the characters in as to who would be the most interesting person to tell the story, what their point of view should be. And I, I basically work from uh, outward down in. And usually I pick the characters, not specifically for the character I want to write, but for the one who's going to tell the most interesting story in that universe. I think I'm a little bit closer to Rick in my approach to it. I think I do tend to look at what, what the overall plot is going to be and then figure out which characters are going to be the best ones to tell that. Though, once I have the character, that often then informs what the story is going to be. So it's a bit iterative, but I think I, I do tend to start with the bigger picture and then work my way down from there as opposed to the other way. But it, that also depends on the series. Some of them have definitely, like the original Catacle series was very much driven by the characters first and then they were into the world. But now when I approach new series, it, it's more that the bigger overall plot and, and uh, what the story's gonna be and then working from that. Yeah, the exception for that for me is when I, when I start a series based on like a short story I've written mm -hmm. and the character from that short story does says, says something to me that I wanna expand on it, but that's, and I've done that. I've, I've tended to do that more and more as my career has gotten more mature. But in the beginning, that's how I did it the other way. Hmm. So what information do you need to know about the story arc when you're writing book one in order to set your, yourself up for success? 
I, it depends for me on, um, on how connect, I mean, how, I don't want to say cliffhanger-ish, but how connected the end of one book is to the beginning of, of the other. If it's something where the, where the, um, the books take place really close together and the story just goes like in a serial fashion, then I have to know from the beginning where everything is going, what arc I'm going to be telling with certain books in the series. But if the books are a little more um, standalone, I mean, they, they tell a, a, an arc in their own, in one book, and then they move on to another arc in the other, then I can sometimes not know anything about the series. Before I, before I start, you know, I just know the first book and then I go from there. Yeah, so how about you, Mel? Because you have so many interconnected storylines. So how does that impact the overall process? I try not to laugh about Rick's dog. So <laughs> I'm I'm about that. That. <laughs> like, what kind of beast is that back there? Oh my God. It's, a, um, it's an 11 year old dog that has a two year old puppy with her and doesn't like him. <laughs> um, now I forget the question. <laughs> um, so, so, uh, so what information do you need to know about the overall series arc when you're starting book one? Um, okay. So even though I like, I start with characters, I love to know, I need, I need to know my setting really well. And this goes back to like when I would read fantasy and get pissed off at fantasy. Uh, one of the ones that would drive me nuts was, um, Terry Brooks, who wrote the, the Shannara series, mm -hmm. Terry Brooks really didn't follow his own maps very well. And sometimes it would take a couple <laughs> of days to get somewhere. Sometimes it would take one day. Sometimes there's like an entire book where they're journeying across this stretch. And the next book, Alanon magically rides a horse in one night through that whole stretch. And it gets really frustrating when you read a story and the universe is changing underneath you. Yeah. Um, Terry Goodkind did the same thing where in the very first of uh, his book, Wizard's First Rule, they go through this one area and it's clearly described as there being nothing there. And mm -hmm. then two books later, they go through that area and there's a big kingdom. One of the biggest kingdoms in the Midlands <laughs> is there. And we're just like, no. And so if you're going to write a series, <clears throat> readers will see that stuff and they'll get pissed off if if their their view of the world changes as they read different books. So even though you might know, you might start with characters or you might start with like a, a grand arc that you need to have. I feel very strongly that the universe, knowing it well, knowing your setting really well, understanding, you know, if you're writing sci-fi, what planets are going to be there. If you're writing fantasy, like make a map, figure out how long it takes to get places. So it's consistent. And, and that's, what's going to make your story feel more real because if you don't know that stuff, it's going to become apparent to the reader that you're just making shit up as you go along. And I mean, I know that's what we're actually all doing. <laughs> that's what we're doing. Yeah. <laughs> but you want to make it look like it's a real place. And you're and this was all intentional. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you want it to be like, like Lord of the Rings where you really felt like there was a whole living, breathing world there because mm -hmm. Tolkien knew about this whole living, breathing world. And when you read stories you that don't languages. have that, <laughs> yeah, he had everything. So when you read a book that doesn't, it feels thin. It feels like it feels like if you were just to pull back the curtain, there's nothing there. So mm -hmm. I feel like it's really important to get that setting nailed for the series because then as it goes on, as long as it needs to go on, the readers aren't gonna be like, Why where'd this come from? They're like, Oh yeah, they mentioned that in book one, you know, or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll, I'll add to that, definitely having some notion of where your character arcs are going. Now, I, I love exploring the journey of, of the character's development, but having some touch points that, like, I know that this character is going to get some sort of power later on, and that's going to be like a book three thing. It's going to be a slow burn to get there, but I know they're going to get there eventually. So you can layer in those little hints at maybe they, they look at an object a little bit differently than other people because there's this thing that's going to be awakening in them later. And just the more that you can add in those little touches, it, the payoff is so much bigger for the reader because they, they will have seen all of these things that are suddenly coming together. And it's, it's kind of a, a cool experience. Um, I, I think I will definitely echo the importance of the world building there and having something. So I, I think one way that if you aren't really sure exactly what you're going to do, you can make a reference to a location, but try to leave out some of the details there and, and let the later on story. But if you at least mention that this place exists and maybe has 
some little aspect to it, just as a teaser. You can then flesh that out more later, but then as readers get to the later books and they actually go to that place, like, oh yeah, they did mention that. Okay, that's a thing. So it's not just this thing that conveniently shows up and it feels like a plot crutch or a character crutch. It if really you had some kind of foreshadowing, it, it feels natural. It can really get confusing if you have, as I do, and now does multiple different series set in the same universe. Mm -hmm. And you have to remember not just things you've written in this series, but everything you wrote in your other series about every world. Yep. Yeah. So to that end, how do you handle it when you write yourself into a corner or you realize in a later book that you should have set something up or should have done something a little bit differently earlier on? Hmm. Try not to do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course. <laughs> I mean, I the, I can't think of a scenario. I mean, I, I distinctly remember writing myself into a corner once or twice in the past, but I can't remember what it is anymore. I think most of the time when I do it, I actually treat it as an opportunity. It's like, okay, I wanted to do a thing, but I can't. How am I now going to get the characters where they need to go? And in many cases, it actually makes for a better story because... It's not like, oh, the characters just get to go from point A to point B. It's like, crap, they can't go from point A to point B. I have to send them to point Q. And then you get to like maybe choose a whole new plot line and you get to like make their adventure more real. So that's usually what I do. I just I just say like, okay, if this was the real world and I was facing this problem, how would I get around it? Mm -hmm. And maybe sometimes I guess you screw up enough, you might have to change your ending, but hopefully you can work your way around it. I, I outline pretty carefully. And although I don't, remember every detail from my universe. I, I mostly can keep enough of it in mind that uh, I don't tend to screw up that badly. Uh, I believe I have screwed up planets and their orbits and their weather once or twice, but uh, that's the kind of thing that uh, once it's published, it, you, unless you want to go back and change every mention of the name, you, know, mm -hmm. you just have to live with it. <laughs> Yeah, there have been a couple of little things that I've gone back to correct. Um, nothing major or, or like story driven, but um, I, I've like you know changed the spelling of something because I realized that I, I duplicated it and you know, like, something like that. So like it's not going to mess with the audio version so much, but on the page it's it's differentiating. Um, but in terms of the the overall plot details, I I'm kind of like Mal, where I'll I'll take the the it is an opportunity to go in a slightly different direction with something or to explain something. Um, and also as I'm dealing with the expanding universe, I, I'm realizing that I have lots of things that people just sort of look at in a certain way, but there are characters that live in one specific corner of the universe. And so as I am growing that and pulling in characters from others, not everyone looks at that things the same way. So maybe they're going to use a slightly different term for something, or they're just going to have a, a different perception of, of how the tech is used. So those different angles have allowed me to go in and get new explanations for tech that has existed for a really long time. And it was just sort of this thing that was thrown out there in the very early books, like, hey, yeah, they, I mean, they have subspace travel. But now that I'm getting into other books that have people dealing with different problems, I'm actually explaining how that tech works. Mm -hmm. So it, it's it's kind of fun to, to go back and revisit those things that were just a snap decision at one point, but then like, no, I really need to justify this and, and make it work for the universe and have it be a sustainable thing that is going to support everything else that comes after it. So it, what is your preferred release schedule when it comes to actually publishing a series? Uh, do you do it differently for the first few books that come out versus the later ones, or is that a pretty consistent or what? I personally, uh, it depends, because I have a, a publisher for some of the stuff that I put out, and their preferred release schedule is to bank the first three books or so, release them quickly, and then start pre-orders for the for the rest and, and stretch them out a little more. Uh, me, I'm impatient. <laughs> so I usually, and I write pretty quickly. So I usually just release it when it's ready. Like I might delay a little time for promotion, but then I'll, the next one will be ready in less than two months. So it's not like I'm, you know, asking him to wait six months between books. It's just like the publisher will do it a month apart and I'll do it two months. So 
it's not mm -hmm. really much difference. So my preference, um, I've had, I slowed down my writing speed. I used, to, I was doing three to four books a month back in 2018, and I can't quite pull that off anymore. Not like have a life and like see sunlight in my family and stuff like that. So what I do now is like I'm down just to two books a month, um, and I'm, I'm just yeah, just yeah. two books a month. And I'm currently currently actually right now Aeon 14 only has five series ongoing, which is pretty rare. At one point, I think we had like 11 series all running at once. Um, my preference is actually to always have a pre-order for the next book because the easiest way to market a book to someone is when they just finish reading the prior book. So what I used to do, I've actually since lost my pre-order privileges because I've missed 13 pre-order dates. Oh my God. <laughs> so like, yeah, we're not giving it back to you this time. You're gonna have to suffer for a year. Um, <clears throat> and I, like I would just get them moved and moved and moved and moved. But um, I'm gonna ask for the back again pretty soon. But the... I, but I, so basically my books were no more than 90, 90 days apart, but there were also like four or five other series releasing in there. So I think that that kind of kept me going. I think that normally 90 days would be too long if you're only doing one series. I think if you were doing, you know, if you're, if you, if you have a lot of books coming out, you can get away with it. I mean, like Amanda Lee, for example, I think she writes three series simultaneously. And because of that, I think her schedule is like six weeks apart for each book. And that works really well for her. And she doesn't use pre-order. She just just nails it because she can write 9,000 words a day and like mm. go on Pokemon raids and shit like that. She's insane. <laughs> but that's, that's a whole different topic. <laughs> I think how fast you write has a lot to do with that because some people, I mean, I, I can write pretty fast at times. I kind of slow down towards the end of this year because I've been writing three series at a time for almost two years. And I finally just got to the point where I was burning out. So I cut it back some, but when I had that going on, you know, I, I could let the uh, publishers put out one a month and then I put mine out once every two, you know, once every two months or something. And, and I would have a pretty steady release yeah. of uh, one title or another. Uh, so now, now I'm, I'm, I'm counting more on them to do the pre-order stuff and I'm going to, I'm going to slow down my own indie stuff just to try to help preserve my sanity. <laughs> Very yeah. important. Yeah, for sure. That yeah, definitely it, having a work-life balance is important there when, when working on the series, it's, it's great to want to get everything out quickly, but if you are no longer enjoying the process and, and, and aren't having fun with the writing, then that, that's something to take into consideration. So I would, I, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say like sort of along building what you guys are saying is that um, if you, if you can't write, um, like, say you can't write a book a month, you, have, you, you, you can maybe take you six months to write a book and then you, you write like a whole bunch, then you bank them up and you have like a year without releases. That would be a bad thing to do. I would say like, try to release as regularly as you can, as you can and not have massive gaps and stuff like that, which mm -hmm. I think kind of builds on what you guys were saying. Yeah. Um, and th that was honestly one of the reasons that I, I opened up my universe so that I could have other people working on the books with me because I can edit a book a lot faster than I can write a whole one myself. So that that's a, a good strategy. And we'll have a whole other panel on, on the shared universe thing later on this afternoon. Um, but I'm I, not going to be in that one. <laughs> you, you, you have donated much of your time. I very much appreciate all of the, the great content that you've provided. Um, yeah, I, I, I would say I, if you're a decently fast writer, it, it can be good to say, you know, maybe have written book one and have book two almost ready to go. And then you can release those a month apart and then be working on book three. And then so you can have like a, a once a month release or once every six week release initially. And then since you're a little bit ahead of it, then you can be working on them, the subsequent books in there. So um, to, to that end, do you have a recommended number of books in a series? Like if, if you should cap it at a, at a certain amount or just keep going indefinitely with it, what are some of the, the strategies and uh, decision-making behind that? Well, what tends to work and what I prefer to do are usually two different things, but I like, I like trilogies. I, I, I feel like I can tell a, the best story in a trilogy, but you know, financial realities and economic realities being what they are, people want to read long series. Mm -hmm. So, you know, sometimes you have to bite the bullet and stretch your, uh, 
imagination and your creative uh, ability and try to come up with uh, another story arc to go on that series, which I feel, I feel like I'm almost betraying my characters when I do that because they through that trilogy, they've gone through so much suffering and brutality and you've given them a happy ending. And now, Oh, well, you're going to have to go back into it again. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I mean, one of the ways to think about this is like, like Rick was saying is that there's financial realities. So the time to stop is when the series isn't making any money anymore. Um, and you should always be thinking about like, like telling your stories in smaller arcs. It's like, there's sort of like this overarching thing going all the time, but you should only always only be like one book away from wrapping it up. If you have to, if you're trying to do a longer series, um, cause if it starts, if it starts to not work, you don't want to be like, Oh crap, I got to write four more books to wrap this thing up. Exactly. Up in one. <laughs> It's dumb, yeah. So um, I would definitely keep that an eye on that, and also you have to keep in mind that as the series goes on, people might look at that and be like, "I don't want to invest in like a nine, ten, fifteen book series." Um, that's just you're, you're going to have more, even though you're going to make more money on the tail from people, you know, reading through, um, you know, buying the next book, buying the next book, buying the next book. It gets harder to sell book one the more books there are. <laughs> so I feel like. <clears throat> I kind of feel like if you're to have a rule of thumb, five or six is probably what you should aim for the most, I think. But that's mm -hmm. just a rule of thumb. Every series is going to be different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, and six, six books is doable for me, but uh, I'm about to do my first eight book series and going on from there possibly. So we'll see what happens. <laughs> Yeah, and, and uh, piggybacking on that, how do you keep a longer series fresh? Or is there a point that you just shouldn't even be trying to keep it fresh and should just start something else to have a different entry point? You're you're more of an expert on that than I am. <laughs> um, I think, you, I mean, if you can write fast like I can, you can do both at the same time, which is what I did. I wrote series specifically targeted to grab different types of readers and pull them into the same universe. And then once I had them hooked, they'd go on and read other books in the series. But that is definitely a thing to consider that like, you know, if you're writing like a, like a, you know, ground pounding sci-fi series, um, military sci-fi series, and you want to like grab readers from other things, you know, you want to grab space opera readers, you want to grab um, like maybe like naval battle readers or something like that. And you're like stuck in this 10 book ground pounding series, you're going to be a while before you can grab those other readers. So it's, it is kind of maybe a good idea that if you, if you want to branch out and attract more readers who read different subgenres to keep your stuff short, short, because you're just going to have problems otherwise. Um, I did them all at the same time. So I kind of was able to cover that. I was writing sci-fi, romance, military sci-fi, um, space opera, all that stuff all at the same time. But, um, I don't know exactly where I'm going with this. I guess one of these things like <laughs> focus on what's working, but, but yeah, but don't hamstring yourself and lock yourself into really long-term stuff that you're going to have trouble getting out of. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I, one of I totally agree with the part about leaving yourself an out after a certain point. I mean, there have been a couple series where I had intended to make them go long. And then after three books, I'm like, well, this isn't doing as well as I would like. So book four is it, you know, you wrap everything up and they're all going to live happily ever after. <laughs> one of the listeners would like or viewers would like to know how many books you have planned out in advance um, in any given series. And I'm sure that that varies from from series to series, but just in general. Uh, well, for me, it I usually try to have three of them planned out in advance because I like to do three book arcs. Um, there's been I have the the series where I did six books that that whole thing was planned out in advance because I had, I had an advance from Audible and I had to have a, you know, a plot to get to six books. So I, I sat down and I wrote a plot outline for all six books in advance, but usually I try to do three books at a time. Yeah, I'm probably, I probably plan out three, maybe four books at a time as well. And my version of plan is like, I have a rough idea in my head what happens. I don't actually plot or anything like that. Um, but I've actually... It's kind of funny, even though I have a lot of longer series, I've been finding myself writing more trilogies now that I'm thinking about it. Like I just finished my Empire series was a trilogy. Um, and my my latest Genevieve and Queen was a trilogy and my next plan series is a trilogy. So I kind of feel like trilogies are what I want to write right now as well. Although my um, my Ascension War books are going to be 150 to 200,000 words each. So it's like I'm writing epic fantasy level length mm -hmm. um, sci-fi books, which is also an experiment. I'm not sure how well those will work. 
Good for KU Reads, though. <laughs> yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah, I mean, that, that is one of the, the big things with series anyway, of just having that that continuous thing and long, longer books do have the potential to, to make more money if you're in KU. Yeah. Um, so especially with these longer series, how do you keep track of all of the plot threads? Do you have any specific strategies beyond just hold it in your head? Do you have any tools that you use? Um, I have I have usually a, a couple of page uh, not only it's just it's kind of a synopsis, but like a just a, the beats of the series I want to get to. Nothing really detailed, just like, okay, by book six, this has to happen, you know, or book three, however I'm far in advance I'm doing it. I want this to have happened. I don't really say how I'm going to get there, but I, I just try to put like a couple of paragraphs, you know, for, e for each book just to give me an idea of where it's going. Now that can change. It has changed, you know. I. I I added a lot of things in some in some series, but uh, I like to have some kind of idea where it's heading. If not, if not the ultimate destination, at least a direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, Mel, I, I think in our conversations, I know that you are more of a pantser versus a plotter, and Rick is definitely a plotter. I'm a so, discovery writer. That's what we call ourselves now. Yes. Uh -huh. Excuse me. Excuse me. Discovery writer. <laughs> So how how does that interact with co-authoring a a series and uh, working with the, that discovery versus having those plot points all completely hammered out? So my co-authors actually do oftentimes plot their books out, um, even though I don't. And then we'll go over their plots in advance. Not all of them do, though. Some of them actually pants out the books. Um, some of the co-authors I work with, they like they write the entire first draft and then we go through it and I fill in parts that are up to me. Other co-authors I work with, we actually swap chapters back and forth as we go. Um, and that actually kind of works kind of well because you're never more than like, you never you never, you never never invested more than one chapter into mm -hmm. possibly going in the wrong direction. Um, but we do know, like even, even the scenarios where we don't have a written plot, we do talk about where it's going to go. We're kind of like, okay, we, at the end of this book, we need the characters to be here so that in the next book they can do this thing. Mm -hmm. And so we know what we're trying to set everything up for. Um, but I don't have a story. I don't have a, a universe Bible. I don't really plot things out. And the, I'm at the point now where I have 105 books I have to go and research. But I was one of the things that saved me, I think, is that every one of my chapter headings has a date, a location, a date and location information in it. Mm -hmm. So it's very easy to find out who was where when. Um, mm -hmm. Because I just look at a chapter that they're in. And I also have like character lists and stuff like that at the beginning in, of every single book. So I've sort of made it so my own books are researchable by me. So I can go back and figure out where things were. And it's, then it's a good idea. Yeah. yeah, it's it saved my bacon. And like, what was this character's name? Oh, they're right in the front of this other book. Perfect. Although I did recently bring a character back from the dead by accident. <laughs> and, and I destroyed a starship that just magically reappeared in the next book as well. So it's not hey, they, they, they made another starship and renamed it. Yeah, and that's what I'm going with as well. The guy just really liked that name and they just named the next one the same thing. I, I need a universe Bible. I don't have one. And it's, it's really getting to the point with so, as many books. I have like 18 books in this one universe, which is nothing compared to yours, but it's just so many planets and ships and governments and, and people. I, I can't, it's, I, I have to do a lot of research when I'm going to hit something I've hit before. I've tried twice to pay people to build a series Bible for me. And I've sunk over $10,000 into it and end up with nothing. Wow. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's only I, would, I would do it for so much less than that. <laughs> <laughs> it's only very recently that I've started documenting everything, but I, I have found it to be really useful with the series to just make a few notes after completing each book. I, I have started including a short recap at the beginning of mm -hmm. the book because it's now there now is an expanded universe. I, I definitely got that from Mal. So thank you for the inspiration to, to do that. So I'll yeah. have, you know, that 500 to 800. <laughs> Uh, summary at the beginning of, of the next book, which then provides me with a nice recap that I can go back and reference myself um, for some of the key details. And then we'll also include a description of the main characters, planets, a couple of terms in, yeah. in the beginning of each. And, and I, those are really helpful reference points. And yeah, I'm trying to centralize all of those. <laughs> Yeah, they're helpful for me too. When I, because I, yeah, I write like previously in this series, and then mm -hmm. it's actually really quite useful for me because I remember I have to go like read the prior book. <laughs> yeah. part, but sometimes I actually write that before I'll write that right when I'm done the prior book. So when I finish yeah. the book, I'll write the previously <laughs> the series thing so that 
it's already written. I have it handy. The readers have it handy. Yeah. James is making fun of me in the comments, by the way. I, I do have like 11 characters named Terry. <laughs> I had one of them, but I, that was an inherited name. I, yes. that, that was that was assigned to me. So, but yes, Terry Terry's I, awesome. I wound up with a with a lot of characters with the same first sound in their names. I I wrote them in different books, and then I wrote another series where they came together, and I'm like, oh my god, they all start with K. Cherry, like, <laughs> Kelly, Cal. You know, they're all. I, it got to the point where I'm like, I got to come up. I, I'll just call them by a last name because it's getting ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, honestly, that was one of the reasons that I started creating a centralized list of all of the planets that I had used so I could go through and, and sort by first letter. And I'm like, okay, well, I've had too many A planet names. So, well, I don't have a P. <laughs> let's go find, let's find a P planet name to, to round it out. I'll, I'm just working my way through the alphabet. <laughs> and there's some characters definitely lend themselves better to uh, certain... I usually, name, I usually name my planets after uh, gods from different uh, pantheons. And I had to dig really deep because I kind of used up all the obvious ones, like great Greek, Roman. Uh, I've used Native American. I've used Babylonian. I've gone in, I've gone as deep as to go Indo-European gods. Yeah. What little we know about them, you know. It's one, I, I, I've got so many planets named after so many gods. <laughs> <laughs> I do that too, and I'll have different systems. Like each system will sort of have a theme. It's so like one of the yeah, systems exactly, yeah. named after um, named after not Sue um, Mohican. I forget the 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 larger tribe the Mohicans are part of. But anyway, they're named after all those gods. And like every planet, everything is all named after that. And like, okay, it's easy to go here. Remember where I am. Other ones are like Greeks or Romans or Carthaginian stuff like that. But um, it's cool. So Lee would like to know if you have any particular. Uh, manual or software that you use to outline the the series or stories. Oh. <laughs> no, I just use Word. <laughs> I, I looked at Scrivener once and was like, mm, no, it's not for me. I use Word and I just make a separate file that, and I I my outlines are kind of they're not they're not like some people have these systems they use to outline. I just write, you know, like. So, I'll like I'll I'll put background, mm -hmm. and I'll put the background information. Then I'll do a synopsis, and then I'll do character sketches, and then a chapter by chapter outline. Mm -hmm. And I just write it all down like like I'm writing by hand, except it's on on Word. I I do kind of actually outlined. I'll I'll um, go into my Word document, and I have like a template I use. It's all set, up, and I'll actually put in a bunch of chapter headings. And the, the chapter headings would be like you know Tannis goes to Mars or something like that. Mm -hmm. So I will actually do that. Um, and I, I maybe only do it for like the first third of the book. And then as I go a little bit further, I might do a couple more and a couple more. So that's, I guess that's the key. Although my latest book, I actually have this massive Excel spreadsheet. That's actually the outline for it. Cause um, well, yeah, because you're putting so many things together with that one. Yeah. It's got, that book was going to, it's probably going to have over 20 POVs in it. Oh my uh, God. 200,000 words. It's basically five or six novellas all crammed together and they all have to interlink at a certain mm -hmm. point. So I'm like, okay, this thing I have to actually really plan out. So I've actually, I actually took, just, just took an Excel spreadsheet. And I made a column for each major plot line and I wrote out basically all the main events I need to have happen in each plot line and then where they intersect. And I think it's going to work. We'll find out because whenever I do really advanced plot lines, I get bored with the book and I throw them away so I can figure out. So, cause like for me, when I write, I don't know what's going to happen. So it's like, it's like I'm watching a movie. It's like, it's like I'm reading the book and I'm all excited gonna happen i know exactly what you mean I, I used to i used to be a pantser discovery writer whatever uh the first six books that i wrote i did that and i loved it it was it was it was entertaining it was like i'm just letting these characters write the book for me yeah Unfor unfortunately it took me a year to write a book so I oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so Corey asks, do you think an episodic series with self-contained stories should advance a larger story thread? Yes. Usually. It depends. I mean, there's some there's some series that are more monster of the week, but usually there should be some there should be some overall arc to it. Mm -hmm. I think I think it's also a genre thing. Like thriller, absolutely. Every book should be self-contained. Um, yeah. romance, every book should be self-contained. Even if you're doing a duet, usually you want to have the book be fairly self-contained. But I really feel like in science fiction and fantasy, when people are reading a series, they want some overall big bad. They want it to be a D and D campaign, you know, where every book is just that. Yeah. Way. You know, 
That's yeah, my I, I agree with that. And I, I tend to just think of things as uh, like, what, what would I want to read? And I, I love that, that payoff of watching something build over time. So there are, there are certain things and, and certainly genre based that it is nice to just have the standalone and, and you can do that. But if I think if you want things to be interconnected, you should make sure that they really are interconnected and building or they should very much be read as standalone, but, but make a conscious decision going into it, how you want to handle it. Yeah. Uh, so Ellie asks, what is the shortest length that you'd go for in an individual book in a series? That depends on genre a lot. I mean, fan, epic fantasy or, you know, post-apocalyptic, you go from 50,000 to, you know, 200,000 words. Uh, my, my books, I try not to go too much below 80,000, although some have been. Uh, but my military science fiction, I, I try to keep it 80,000 and up. I write space opera, sometimes it goes down to 60 or 70,000, but that's only if that's only if it's just something it's not like the main my main focus series it's just something i'm writing for fun mm -hmm. but usually i try to keep it above 80,000 i think one of the things that's important to do is make it consistent um, the readers should expect the same length of novel in each series if you write mm -hmm. a series you've got like novel length novella novel length novella epic novel you know right. they're going yeah. to be cheese they're going to be like i don't know what to get how much story am i going to get here you want to you want it's I mean, so much about everything is, is setting expectations. So you want to set the right expectations, make sure that they know what they're going to get. Um, I have some series that are novellas and there's like the longest book in the, in that, in those novellas, I think is 45 K. Some of them are all the way down to like 27 K. Um, and dollars for donuts. Those are the most profitable words I've ever written actually. So that's sort of a, and it, but that, that one I think is sort of unique. It was a spinoff of a, for a character that everybody really liked and they wanted mm -hmm. to know what happened to that character. Uh, I don't know if that normally works, but, um, I also priced them cheaper. They were only two ninety nine, so it was all sort of like you know, it's a shorter story, it's a lower price. It's characters you guys just want, to, and, and that one actually was more episodic too. But um, I think that sort of what what Rick was saying, like in general, my major series, I shoot for eighty k as well. I feel like that's where people are going to feel like they're getting their money's worth. They've got enough entertainment to last them a couple of days. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I typically target um, seventy to ninety for for mine. Some are a little bit longer, some are shorter. Uh, but but that is has sort of been the the sweet spot for me. Um, I, I think much shorter than that, and you don't have the same depth there. And I tried doing some shorter ones, but I, I have found that my readers seem to respond more to the to the longer books, and um, that just kind of lets me do my thing and having more plot threads weaving together rather than just having a straightforward story. And, and some of that's just going to be genre expectation. So. Mm -hmm. um, I think just know know what does well in your specific subgenre and take it from there. So, uh, are are there any series that you can think of that just really went on too far? Someone here is asking about the Shannara series, and if you think that that did just stretch on longer than it needed to. <laughs> wheel of time. <laughs> mm -hmm. it, yeah, it, wheel of time. But wheel of time is such a great name for that series, considering how much time it took and how it felt like a wheel just grinding you down. <laughs> oh, I, I, to be honest, Rick, Wheel of Time was what came to mind for me first as well. Um, I like Shinara because at least with Shinara, it's entirely, it's very different characters in very different situations. Mm -hmm. So you, you do like he, Terry Brooks at least wrote, wrote smaller trilogies or quad, quad, quadrilogies, whatever, um, <laughs> quartets maybe. Um, <laughs> He wrote at least those so that the characters had an arc and they wrapped up and you could kind of feel like, okay, I get a story that's done. Um, the Chris Longknife books are ones that I feel like kind of just went on and on and on too long as well in, in just one monolithic series. I think that Mike Shepard has finally started breaking them up, but I kind of lost interest when I got to like book 14 where it was, it was really just like Chris was just constantly just doing the same stuff. I'm like, I don't know, this isn't going anywhere anymore. So leaving genre fiction, I think the Reacher series went on way too long and still is. I mean, it could make him so much money, he's still gonna yeah. have his son write it now. But uh, it it got repetitive after about eight or nine books. So so what are some uh some maybe red flags you could say for okay, I think it's time that we should probably be wrapping this up reviews <laughs> if, yeah. if readers think it's going too long they'll tell you in the reviews they're like stop this series already 
and there's always the crass economic reason you're not making money anymore. Mm -hmm. But I mean, for an artistic reason, I think if you're telling the same story over and over, then you've gone on too long. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think that kind of goes back to that, having some big end goal in mind. And maybe as you're doing the discovery writing along the path, what you thought was going to be a trilogy has stretched out into a five or seven book arc because you haven't gotten to that thing yet. But once you achieve that goal, if you haven't thought about the, a new big thing that's going to be the next challenge there, that's kind of still the natural end point. And that, that can be uh, a good indication to, to wrap things up there and then think of something new and maybe it's a you can take one character from that original series and, and do a spin-off with them or or any number of things. But I think each series does have sort of a, a natural scope to it. Mm -hmm. And some are going to be a much smaller, shorter term scope and some are going to be a really long epic thing. But uh, try, try to have those goals in mind so you can have a satisfying experience for both you as a writer and have that sense of accomplishment. And then also for your readers to have a good payoff and it's not getting stale by the end. And it's like, oh, okay, well, it's over. Thank goodness it's over. It's, <laughs> oh yeah, that was a great ending. I'm, I'm so happy that I went on this journey with them. So uh, any closing thoughts that you would like to share? I would say leave yourself room. I mean, if you, I, I mean, for Mal, it's not a problem, but for people who outline everything and plot, leave yourself room to explore. Don't don't close yourself into a, an arc that doesn't let you go where you need to go. Yeah. I think, I, oh, sorry, were you, were you done, Amy? Oh, I, I, I agree with that. <laughs> that's one thing that I learned early on. I, I used to have these very detailed outline scene by scene and then i would get to a point like this this isn't working and i would feel really bad and i'd be trying to force fit it in there but i realized that that was just my gut telling me that that was going to be really boring for the reader to go mm -hmm. through so so really listen to your instincts there and just because you have something planned out it doesn't mean that that's necessarily the right way to to do it and and do be flexible and try to keep yourself open to thinking about things in a different way yeah, I like what you said about boring books be boring for the reader. My pol my policy for myself is if it's boring for me to write it, it's probably going to be boring to read it. Yeah. Um, so if I find myself in those positions, like someone's got to die, someone's got to blow up, you know, <laughs> and, and and that's why I'm like, okay, my plot isn't interesting. So I, yeah, so I throw something into it, you know, some crazy person shows up, uh, multiple villains rise at the same time, what, what someone mentioned there, like, I'll, I'll do that. I'll have someone else show up. And you're like, oh, crap, this isn't the bad guy I thought we were going to be facing. Yeah, totally. Well, Mal, where can we find you on the interwebs? Um, you can find me on Amazon under MD Cooper. Um, all my books are available there. And you can also go to aeon14.com, which is the website for the whole universe. And if you want to just chat me, you can always just search for Mallory Cooper on Facebook and feel free to re reach out to me, message me or anything as well. And what about you, Rick? Uh, rickpartlow.com. Uh, I'm also on Amazon. My author page is Rick Partlow. There's only one other Rick Partlow that I know of who uh, is a Dolby artist and bit, and bit actor in, in Hollywood, and he hasn't written too many books, so I should be easy to find. Uh, my Facebook page is facebook.com backslash duty on our planet, which I shouldn't have named that, but I was young. Um, and uh, I, I'm pretty available. You can message me. I'll answer you personally. Email me at dutyhonorplanet487 at gmail.com. I will answer personally. I'm not I'm not so popular that I won't. <laughs> the same I, way, yeah. I can attest that both of these are some of the most generous and open authors that you will encounter. And I am very happy to have them as my, my author buddies. Uh, so for me, I, I write under AK Duboff and you can find me under there. But my website is amyduboff.com. I went through a rebranding a couple years ago, which makes things super fun and confusing for everyone. Um, and then catacol.com will take you to the Catacol Universe stuff. And I'm on social media at Amy Duboff, um, most platforms. So thank you so much for attending today. And I would like to give a shout out to Keystroke Medium for being a wonderful sponsor for this convention and doing lots to support this inaugural SIFCon. So thank you all for listening. I hope you got some good feedback on this. If you would like to hop over to Discord, if you have any questions that didn't get answered, we will be happy to see you over there. So thanks. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the weekend. <laughs>